it has uh, puzzled me that I know at least, shall we say, over the years, about 20 actors who are every bit as accomplished as I am. And uh, for the most part, I may say, far better looking. And the same size and weight and shape with all the accoutrements of what one would think a star, for lack of a better word, should have. Good voice, good presence, good eyes. And they haven't made it. And I can never quite figure it out, and I can only assume it's some sort of diabolical or even divine luck. But there are about 20 or 30 people like that in the world, and they don't know, but they worry about it, because I know most of them very well, but I never worry about it. But I do sometimes wonder about it. I mean, what we have to remember is the incredible journey this man took. He set off with hardly any acting lessons, became one of the greatest actors on the London stage. All his rivals and peers say that now and said that then, as do Olivier and Gielgud. From nowhere, Gielgud kept saying he came. He became number one box office in the cinema and made some magnificent films. He outbid Onassis for diamonds. He dined every night with Kissinger. Bobby Kennedy was a friend. Brando was a friend. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor. He held all that in thrall. He was a great Welsh hero. He never lost his Welshness. If he could have done one thing more than any other, he would have wanted to be a Welsh international to play rugby before else. And again, he could have done. Allow me to introduce myself. Major Johann Schmidt, S.S. First of all, I went to see this beautiful baby, Richard. I'm not saying it because I brought him back. But he was handsome. I took him in to the living room, and I asked my brother, Ivor, oh, isn't he lovely, I said. Yeah. I don't want to talk about babies now. He said, I'm on my breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> we were 11, and they were uh, seven boys and four girls, and Thomas Henry, the eldest boy, he was named after the two grandfathers. Then uh, my sister Cecilia Jane came, which was named after uh, my father's sister Jane, and then Ivor, Ivor Glynn, and then William, and after William, David Arthur. After David Arthur, there came Virgin, and then I was the first girl to come after all those boys to have a sister for Cecilia. So she named me Hilda. Then my sister Catherine came, and Edith, and then Richard, of course, and uh, the last one was Graham. To begin at the beginning, 
I was born the 10th of November, 1925, in Pontchartrain, which is a little village in South Wales, which actually means something. It means the bridge across the Vale. And there's a bridge that spans the valley from mountain to mountain. And at one time, we lived one side of the bridge. And when I was born, we'd moved underneath the bridge. Starless and Bible black. I was the last but one of 13 children. Though I always think of them as 11, because two of them died before I was born. They died in infancy, I believe. Down to the slow black, slow black. Of course, there was a colliery nearby. Even brother used to work, and Will, my brother, used to work there. Every one of the brothers, bar Richard and Graham, worked in the pit. I was unfortunate. I lost half my foot in the pit, you know, in a, a colliery accident, and where I lost my part of my hand as well. I've seen so much in the pit, you know, people being killed. And when I was working in the steelworks, you know, I saw men being blown to smithereens and just their leather belts hanging on hand railings, you know. You must realize that underground is total darkness. There's not a beam of light anywhere. Terrifying when that's the only thing you'd hear would be a, a rat scuttling underneath your feet, you know. When I started at 14 and two days old, I was the only one working in the family. It was just after, you know, in 1930, of course. And um, during the Depression, who worked to be had anyway? The Oakwood Colliery had closed, and a lot the Cannon Pit had closed, and they were all closing. And I was earning seven and six a week in the old money. So you just imagine what it was like. When I was two years old, my mother gave birth to my younger brother, Graham, and five days after the birth, she died. On the morning, I think it was the 31st of October, 1927, there was the doctor, the midwife, and elder sister Sis. And I well remember my father falteringly coming down the stairways. And I realized with mounting horror what he was saying to me. Davy, he said, my revam widimaru, your mother has died. Since there were seven children in the house under the age of 14, and my eldest sister was married and my eldest brother was married, it meant that there was nobody responsible enough to look after the very tiny ones. And so it was decided that uh, I should go and live with my sister, uh, who was married to a minor called Elvert James, who lived in a place called Taibach. And so we left home. Now, as I was young and easy under the apple boughs, about the lilting house and happy as the grass was green, the night about the dingle star, and I thought, such a shame, you know, youngsters, ten children under 14. And I thought, I've got to come out of this. I've got to work it off, you know. And uh, there was plenty of work there, I can tell you. You went to the infant school, and uh, you said, I don't know what they're talking about in that school, and that school is right by our house. This was the English <laughs> school, you see. I don't know what they're talking about in Welsh. And uh, I said, well, you'll have to come to um, learn the English as well, you see, I said, you know. I used to get up when the miners got up, which was very early in the morning, because they had to walk to the bus, and, and they had to start at six, so they generally got up about half past four. And I would get up more or less the same time as they do, they did. And I, I used to go up to the top of the mountains and collect uh, uh, sheep dung and horse dung and uh, cow dung uh, in a sack, which I then used to take home, put in the, the coal shed. We used to work like dogs. And on the Saturday, I would then sell the dung, sixpence a bucket, I remember I used to get. And most of the people would keep the newspapers for me. Then I would deliver the newspapers to a fish and chip shop because in those days they wrapped fish and chips in the newspaper, as you know. They would pay me for that. And then, when I was 14 years old, I left school, and I went to work in a 
haberdashery, which I, uh, that's one period of my life which I really detested. Because um, it was so unmacho, if you know, I much prefer to have gone down the mines. And I sold uh, pants and vests hopelessly. I was quite inept. <laughs> Yep. My father was a miner, of course. He was very short. Uh, he was very powerful, very strong, a great miner. I remember going home, and he was a very old man by this time. I mean, he was about 80, I think. Took him to the pub, and he was sick. He had flu. We took him to the miner's arms in Ponte de Ville. And I said, uh, Betty Moyne, what would you like? And he said, oh, I don't know. And he was really, he was streaming with cold, and he flew and everything. And I said, well, I'm going to have an American drink, I said. It's called a Boilermaker. And he said, what's that? And I said, well, in my case, it's a double shot of scotch with a pint of beer to chase it. And he said, oh, I'll have that. Make mine rum. And I said, oh, we'll all have rum. There were five of us in a row, six of us at my father. So we ordered six double rums, six pints of beer. Before the fellow had served me, my father had finished his. And I said, do you, mind me? do you want mine? He said, all right, took mine, he drank it. Then the other brothers were fascinated. They said, do you want mine? He drank those two. He drank the whole thing in a row. Absolutely extraordinary. Went home and the next day, temperature had gone. Best cure in the world, he said. Best cure for flu in the world. Boilermakers, very good at the Americans, very clever race. And he'd look at us all, and we'd all look at him. And he'd sing, forgive and forget all the troubles we've met. We'll be friends with each other again. In English, he would say it. And everybody would say, I'll oh, put him to bed. <laughs> you couldn't resist him. Another father figure was a man called Meredith Jones, who taught me at the secondary school in the scholarship class. He and the most powerful man on the board of governors at that time, Sir William Haycock, changed my life. The anxiety of Mr. Meredith Jones and that she was to get back into the local grammar school. He felt now that he'd like to go in for teaching, and his ambition was to get down to Carmarthen Training College. So I went to the governor's meeting that particular Monday evening, and despite the objection of the headmaster, who let Richie Burton into the school. There, of course, came the next considerable influence on my life. who was a, an English master at the school called Philip Burton, P.H. Burton who was something of a writer for the BBC and an occasional producer of programmes. He taught the last lesson, and after everybody had been dismissed, I uh, lagged behind, and finally I plucked up the courage to go and talk to him. I said, well, my goodness, you can't be an actor and speak like that. He said, well, change it. <laughs> and that was the first thing. And then he told me that he'd tried to leave home a few times, and no member of the family would take him in. And I, I didn't realize what I was saying. I said, well, there's an empty bedroom in my house. You can take that. You mean it? I said, no, no, no. Oh, he put on such a sad act, you know. Nobody wants me. So I told him, I don't think that his sister would allow him to come. He said, come and ask them. So I did on a Sunday afternoon. I'd never been to the house before. Sis, the sister, didn't say a word. Elvid did everything. Richard wasn't there. He was waiting outside for the decision. And Elvid said, oh, you, you take him, Mr. Burton. You take him. You take him. I said, well, let me see Richard a moment. So we went out to get Richard. And that was my opportunity to ask Sis what she thought about it. She hadn't said a word. And she said, if you take him, it will be the answer to my prayer. We didn't. Um, know him. I mean, he had great respect in the community. He was very, very well, highly thought of teacher. And uh, he was held in great respect by everyone. Most, everyone. But we held him in awe. I mean, there was this man that Can came into our lives and was interested in one of us. He used to come and visit us quite often during all these negotiations, mm. and he always said, now, what books are you reading? And so on. I mean, we were terrified, absolutely terrified by this man because he spoke such precise English. We'd never come across anyone like this. 
Excuse me. I have never spoke to you. I have never spoken to you. But I have seen you many a time. On this very place when you have took your walk. When you have taken your walk. Richard's voice was rough with a, with a strong Port Talbot accent. Excuse me. So the years of drilling began. The years of discipline started there. Richard called it the Room of Terror. Hour after hour, from 4 o'clock after school until 10, 11 or 12 o'clock at night. It was very difficult to shout in a house, you know, because other people around and people next door would think you'd gone mad and so on. And it sounds terribly romantic and idiotic, but in actual fact, I used to go to the top of the mountain and scream as loudly as I could until my voice hurt. Then when it hurt, I waited for a bit and then screamed again to fix it in some way so that it didn't hurt. And that it was a very primitive way of doing it, but it worked. I know it's no good time, but have you any gloves? I'm afraid I don't speak Welsh. We have not got nothing in stock good enough to offer. Oh. Thank you. And then an advertisement appeared in the newspapers. It could only have happened in wartime, because there was a shortage of young men. All the young men were called up and gone. And I was 16. Not got nothing good enough. Not even grammar. There was an ad in the papers by Emlyn Williams, the well known playwright and actor, who said that Emlyn Williams, the Welsh playwright and actor, was looking for a young man of 22 who could speak Welsh and who could act. Well, I knew I could speak Welsh. I wasn't too sure if I could act. Did that play with Emlyn for, I should think, about seven or eight months then left the play and went up to Oxford University, but the bug had bitten. It's a very powerful um, drug. No, George, please, I don't. Don't you touch me. I'll keep your paws clean for the undergraduates. So listen to me, Martha. You can't cut it out just whenever there's enough blood in your mouth. We're going on, and I'm going to have at you, and it's going to make your performance tonight look like an Easter pageant. I want you to get yourself a little lift. I want a little life in you. Stop that! Pull yourself together. Uh, I want you on your feet in slugging, because I'm going to knock you around, and I want you... Up uh, for it! All right, George, what do you want? An equal battle, baby, that's all. You'll get it. I want you mad. I'm mad. Get madder. Don't worry about it. Good girl. We played this one to the death. Yours. You'll be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> trying to get Richard to Oxford. A few places were given for six months to people who were joining the RAF. And it had to be recommended by the chief officer in Wales. And he told me, there's a difficulty, you know. This boy's name is Richard Jenkins, and your name is Philip Burton, and his father is living. Uh, it might be a bit suspicious about your relationship. He said, why don't you adopt him? Give him your name, honestly. So as soon as I put that to Richard, he said, oh, great. <laughs> First of all, the city council had to approve, and they knew me pretty well, so they immediately approved. Then the lawyer started working, and he discovered that I could not adopt him because I was 20 days short of being 21 years older than he. He was on the 10th, and I was on the 30th of November. If it had been the other way around, he would have been my son. So instead, I became his legal guardian, and the name was changed by deed poll. So he, he, the, this document was drawn up, and the father had to be found to sign it, which he did. And so he became my legal guardian, Richard Burton. What Richard wanted was not available to him. He could no longer go back before Philip Burton. And Philip Burton could not give him anything that was born in him. Philip Burton could not give him his earliest impressions, could not give him his earliest longings Philip Burton could give him the manners and the language 
and the means whereby he could play anything, on stage and off. When Richard performed, that was the only real life he knew, when he could be somebody else. Who looks at Burton? Who, who looks at Burton by looking at what I'm playing? And if they strip me of what I'm playing, what am I? I'm a frightened little Welsh kid before Philip Burton. He has no real reference points of his. I wish there was somebody in this life I could show. One instinctive, absolutely unbrisk person that I could take to Greece and stand in front of certain shrines and sacred streams and say, look, life is only comprehensible through a thousand local gods. Not just the old dead gods with names like Zeus, but living geniuses of place and person. And not just Greece, but modern England. Here, spirits of certain trees, of certain curves of brick wall of certain fish and chip shops if you like and and slate roofs and frowns in people and slouches i'd say to them worship all you can see and more will appear When he came to Oxford as an undergraduate in 1944, he had an astounding beauty, a blend of classic Greek serenity and smouldering Celtic fires emanating from mystery and humour, and above all, the fires of enormous laughter. His laughs have always been as infectious as his rages can be terrifying. Behind all, there is an element of Welsh Glendourish magic or mystery. We met when we were both quasi RAF at Oxford at a meeting of the Experimental Theatre Club when Richard did one of his amazing eruptions into the proceedings. And I hadn't even noticed him. The room was full of um, people who were vitally interested in theatre. and um, All undergraduates, all undergraduates. And they were waffling on a good deal. And suddenly, when it really got extremely tiresome, up shot Richard by the piano, I can see it now, and said in that extraordinary voice with a very Oxford accent, with hardly a trace of Welsh, because he'd really brushed it up to come to Oxford. Um, if you want the best director in the country to do this, I can get him for you. And there were squeaks and <laughs> groans, and somebody said, oh, really, who? And Richard said, my father, and sat down, <laughs> meaning Philip, of course. I was uh, fairly ruthless uh, when I arrived at Oxford, uh, fresh from uh, South Wales with a powerful Welsh accent, and determined to play the leading part in whatever Oud's production was coming up. Now, during the war, as you know, the Ouds didn't exist, but there was a substitute company called the Friends to the Ouds, which was dominated and has been dominated for many years by... Uh, Professor Neville Coggill, and I arrived and said, I'm an actor. I said, I'm an actor, and I want to play Angelo in your present production. And he said, well, it's, uh, I'm afraid it's already cast. And I said, oh, well, I'll, sp I'll, I'll speak some poetry for you. So he said, all right. And I spoke to be or not to be, and at the end of it, he said, well, you can't play Angelo, but uh, at least uh, is it all right if you understudy? And eventually, the man playing Angelo came ill, uh, nothing to do with me, nothing to do with the Welsh and wizardry, and uh, I played the whole thing. I was assured a future from it by Hugh Beaumont of H.M. Tennant, who saw it at the time. I remember he was always correcting me with my homework, very 
ready to help, but if I didn't get it the first time, oh, for heaven's sake, as many brothers would, but he was never cruel to us or never hit us. Never, never unkind. Never fights. Marion and I used to fight, but Rich would never get involved with a, a fight. But impatient, <laughs> but always correcting us. But I remember when he said, I'm going to Oxford. And I said, going to Oxford? Oh, and he yeah. said, Oxford. <laughs> and I said, but I said Oxford. And he said, you don't say Ford, you say Ford. Wrap it up, will you? Stop ringing those bells. There's somebody going mad in here. I don't want to hear oh, Stop shouting. It was only my second time in England, leave alone at Oxford. Uh, what I discovered was that after time, though you got occasional people, I generally found from lesser public schools, I became a bit of a snob myself, who uh, would invariably greet me with, how are you today, indeed to goodness, which used to drive me stark staring man. But generally the people from the better schools treated me absolutely as an equal. I had no problem at all. I blacked a few eyes in the first three weeks or something. And what about mummy? How does mummy spend her day of rest? We usually go to Thank church. Thank you, dear Vicar, for the nice, cosy sermon. And then she tramples off over better men's graves, home to an orgy of curry. Mummy and Daddy and Brother Nigel, if he's up from town. Do you know her Brother Nigel? No, I don't. Well, you never heard so many well-bred commonplaces come from beneath the same bowler hat. The platitude from outer space. That's Brother Nigel. Why don't you dry up, or you? They're either militant like a mummy and daddy, militant, arrogant, and full of malice, or else they're vague, like Nigel and her. Nigel and Alison. They're what they sound like. Sycophantic, phlegmatic, and pusillanimous. Big words. Shall I tell you what they mean? No, 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 not interested. Soapy, stodgy, and dim. Sounds like a musical act. Ladies and gentlemen, those old favorites, your friends and mine, soapy, stodgy, and dim. Bringing quips and strips for you. For we may be guilty, guilty darling, but we'll be both insane, insane as, as well. well. Ladies and gentlemen, as I was coming to the theater tonight, I was passing the stage, an old man comes up to me yeah. and he says, Have you seen nobody? Have I seen who? Have you seen nobody? Of course I haven't seen nobody. Kindly don't waste my time. Ladies and gentlemen, a little recitation entitled, She was only a grave digger's daughter, but she loved lying under the sod. Are you Thank quite you. sure you haven't seen nobody? Of course I haven't seen nobody. Will you kindly go away? Can't you see I'm trying to entertain this lady here? The lady pusillanimous. You did half your time as an undergraduate, and half your time in uniform. And he was based up at Murray at Bircham Newton in Norfolk, where he and his followers, and he had a complete clan, there were some other pretty tough spirits up there. There was a, 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 an international rugby player of, of a later time, uh, also Welsh. There were other Welshmen there. There was Mick Meisel, who later became Warren Mitchell, and various others. Uh, of his court, of his empire there, and of this group, the sergeants and corporals, warrant officers who should have been in charge, lived in daily fear. One got thrashed by suggesting that they were behaving out of turn, and he got taken apart. But they lived outside the law, both civil and military, and they poached the pheasants of the local gentry and cooked them and ate them. And um, some of them, I think, including Richard, were actually arrested and faced severe punishment. And then the authorities came down and said, no, these, these, uh, these boys are being sorely tried. They're all uh, thoroughbred trainees, you know, on whom a great deal of money had been expended. Also, they're rather good at playing rugby. So lay off. And they amazingly got away. They got away with... Not murder, but not far short, I think. I was in the RAF for three years. I was a sort of navigator. I say sort of because the war was over almost as soon as I entered, and I was made what is known as redundant. However, I was demobbed and routed home to Wales via London. I had four hours to wait between trains in London, and it did cross my mind that that very nice man, Mr. Hugh Beaumont, had told me to come and see him if I decided to become an actor. So I thought I'd have time between trains. I went to the Globe Theatre, went up in the lift, and waited for two and a half tortuous hours. Binky Beaumont gave me a contract for 10 pounds a week for a year and immediately put me to work in a successful play called Dark Summer. 
And it was while I was on tour that Emlyn Williams asked me to make a screen test for a film which he was about to do called The Last Days of Dolwyn. I'm supposed to have discovered Richard Burton, but really the discovering had already been done by Philip Burton and by Daphne Rye, who was casting director for H.M. Tennant. I was first struck with the personality of a man with the rare gift of repose. The startling looks, fearless eyes set widely in a dramatic face, the face of a boxing poet, a face whose only lack was experience clean adolescent leaf waiting for her life to write on it. My father used to make sure that Richard wasn't exploited by people because a young actor, particularly coming from South Wales, suddenly in the maelstrom of the West End in those days, could get into all sorts of trouble. I remember once that he went to see Binky Beaumont. It finished up with Richard asking for some more money. Very, very frightened because Mr. Beaumont was a very powerful man. And, uh, he said, I think I should be paid more, sir. And Binky said, how much more were you thinking of? And Richard said, I thought another five pounds a week, making it up to 25 pounds a week, I think an absolute fortune. So Binky says, yes, all right. So jubilant Richard goes back home to where we lived. And as he gets back, my father's just coming out of the house and getting into a taxi. And he said to Richard, how did it go? He said, you won't believe it, Emily, I got another five pounds. And my father said, you go right back in my taxi and go up and see Binky and tell him you won't do it for a penny less than 30 pounds. And Richard said, I can't do that. He's just given me an extra five. I can't go right back and ask for another five pounds. He said, you do exactly as I say, says my father. So he gets into the taxi, shaking, and he goes back up in the lift, into Binky's office, said, I've reconsidered, Mr. Beaumont. I'm afraid I can't do it unless I get another five pounds. And Binky looked at him and said, that old Welsh pit pony's been at you. <laughs> he got it. She'd forgotten one thing, money. Money can buy anything, my friend, and I've got it. Put that can down. Aren't you the one that calls himself her son? <laughs> The one who doesn't know who his real father was. You say that again, you'll be sorry. You're not fit to lick my boots. Neither you nor her. Say one word about her, I'll kill you. But I'm going to pay you both to clean my boots. Because you're the scum of the earth. Both of you. Scum! 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 <clears throat> I'd heard in 1948 and 49 of a brilliant young Welsh actor who had been discovered by Emlyn Williams and came from something of the same kind of working class background that he had. When we were casting The Ladies Not For Burning, which was rather a tricky business because it was a very new kind of play, the management, H.M. Tennant, suggested Richard Burton for the part of the boy. And the only thing that used to annoy me, he was very greedy and he always wanted his lunch. He used to yawn at about quarter to one if I didn't say we could break. But, and I didn't get to know him at all in that play. But we ran about a year and then we played it in America for six months. And he had various love affairs with people connected with the play. <laughs> and, um, I could see that he had enormous charm. He had the kind of effect on an audience that an actor called Henry Ainley, who was a great star of my youth, also had, that he simply turned his face to the audience and looked at them with these blue eyes. And they were sort of seduced immediately. He had the most extraordinary appeal in just the way he looked at you. In fact, uh, I could never repay him the debt that I owe him. Uh, first of all, he cast me in The Ladies Not For Burning. And then in the course of the play, in which I made uh, something of a success, he then took me out of the play and put me into another play, The Boy With The Cart, which he directed again himself, and indeed uh, made me into what is uh, casually known as a leading man. As you know, this play is about this uh, strange little saint, Cuthman, who has tried to build a church, the villagers and everybody who helps him, they can't put up the king post, the, uh, the key post in the church. And he's left alone on the stage, and the other people go off, having despaired of building this church. And they come back, and it's in place. But gradually, 
I was aware of someone in the doorway and turned my eyes that way and saw carved out of the sunlight a man who stood watching me so still that there was not other such stillness anywhere on the earth so still that the air seemed to leap at his side he came towards me and the sun flooded its banks and flowed across the shadow he asked me why i stood alone his voice hovered on memory with open wings and drew itself up from a chine of silence as though it had long time lain in a vein of gold. Richard first met Sybil when he was doing his first film, The Last Days of Dolwyn. And Sybil was an extra. She was an actress, actually, but she was moonlighting as an extra. And I remember one of her dodges was there was quite a number of extras playing Welsh peasant women with headscarves tied around their hair, you know. So at the end of the day, they all had to line up and be paid. Well, Sybil conceived this brilliant idea of arriving with a number of different headscarves. Therefore, she'd line up and get her five pounds, whatever it was, and then go back to the end of the queue and put on another one and receive another five, which I thought was most enterprising. And she was a wonderful wife to Richard, I mean. You know, she'd put up with the late nights when he'd come back with the boys, and suddenly she had to cook scrambled eggs for five chaps, and she was just expecting Richard to come home, and all that. And she took it all in her stride and adored it, and didn't disapprove. There's no shadow of a disapproval about it. It was part of the life that she knew Richard enjoyed. I said goodbye. What do you want? It isn't goodbye. Look into my eyes. Is there a hint of madness in them? Do you want to be tied to a drunkard and a libertine? To a man who believes he's tainted with his father's madness? Do you know what it's like not to know? Not to be able to believe that the talent I possess is not a curse as well? Do you want to be tied to that? I see no madness in your eyes, Edwin. Nor in the heart and soul of the man beyond them. I know that with my whole being. How can you know? How can you know what I am? I know. I want to spend my life with you. For He adored her, and he knew how valuable she was to him. She was the class act, always. Uh, she was the, the, the woman of tremendous integrity and values and standards, absolutely straight and clear, no question. Well, you know, Richard's values were not very good, and his standards I don't think were either. And I think she had a tremendously positive effect on him. Not enough, unfortunately, because the the wicked side got wickeder and wickeder <laughs> as time went along. But for as long as they were together, she was the steady one. And I said to Sybil, do you have a lovely Christmas? She said, oh, yes, we went home to Ponto de Ven. I said, what do you get for Christmas then? She said, I didn't think I was going to get anything. But she said, on Christmas morning, Richie he put a red ribbon in my hand. And he said, follow that. And she said, I followed it downstairs, through the parlor, out of the front door, and around the corner, and there was a red MG. I first met him in 51 at Stratford when he played Hal and Henry V. It was his happiest time. It's all going to happen for him, and he knew it. I remember that I was nearly fired because I tried to explain that what I was trying to do was to be solitary and removed and cold and certainly not the thigh-slapping, stamping, roaring with laughter Prince Hal that we'd all been accustomed to. Hokey didn't notice too much that was special because... 
<laughs> By that time, I think he'd had a couple of drinks, and he said, well, it's Henry the Fourth, part 12, and Henry the Fifth, part 9, and... <laughs> he knew he was... A, I mean, Bogey was a, knew about acting, and he really knew... Uh, I mean, he recognized an actor when he saw one. But Richard, he immediately started to flirt with me. The fact that Bogey and Sybil were there did not bother him at all. And insisted that he take me to Shakespeare's grave. So he dragged me around. And of course, Bogey understood knowing young actors and his young wife. He said, what the hell, you know, what is he gonna do? And Sybil, of course, understood. So he took me around and um, showed me the grave and was filled with this incredible sense of adventure. And it was almost swashbuckling, you might say, you know, it was all that kind of whisking you away dramatically and kind of romantically, even though it wasn't a romance. But the whole idea of it was, it was rather fantasy-like. I mean, it didn't have a lot to do with reality. You must know that the curtain of every theater has a peephole through which the actors can look at the audience. And I can't tell you how often on opening nights I've stared at this seat in the stalls and wished to high heaven I was there. You know, one of the problems an actor has to face his first night nerves, and each actor devises his own method of combating it. For instance, one is generally expected to turn up in the theater at least half an hour before the curtain goes up. That is, unless you're Rex Harrison. Now, what Rex does is to charge into the theater about five minutes before he's due, slap on his makeup, pull on his costume, and go rushing onto the stage, muttering to himself, my dear fellow, I don't know why I do it. Why do I do it? Why do I go through this agony? I don't know, but Rex knows that if he doesn't do this, he'd probably be too nervous to go on. Another friend of mine, a noble, distinguished actor from England, goes to the theater about two hours before he's due to go on, puts on his makeup with meticulous care, dresses with even greater care, and finally goes down to the curtain about four minutes before he's due to go on, stands with his mouth about two inches away from the curtain and in a silent scream of fury, insults the audience. You dotes, you numbskulls, there's not one of you out there who'll do what I'm gonna do tonight. Not one of you, not one of you, not one of you. And then the curtain rises and it's, now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this son of your. And what do I do? Well, I go to the theater trembling and shaking all over. And Alec Guinness told me one day that the only way that I could combat this was to transfer the external symptoms of my nervousness and put it to some place where I couldn't be seen, so I transferred it to my feet. So now my feet continually do that, like that all the time. They're doing it now. Well, this worked marvelously until one day I was playing a part called Coriolanus. Uh, Coriolanus is a Roman and he wears open-toed sandals. Well, I can only tell you for the first half hour of the play, the audience were dominated by my feet. <laughs> Long a holiday centre of stately interest, Edinburgh celebrates its great festival of music and drama. At the Assembly Hall, Miss Faye Compton is one of a fine cast that is playing Hamlet. In a new role, Richard Burton plays the young Prince of Denmark, while Claire Bloom adds to the production as Ophelia. And uh, she said to me, Oh, Billy, you look after me, won't you, because that dreadful man. And apparently she took offence, because when they were in Ladies Not for Burning, Richie was on the Guinness, see. It's a pretty old, powerful old odor, I suppose. And she thought that any man who drank Guinness was, was gone to hell. And there was a pub opposite called the Olive Branch. One day, he said, uh, you f***ing Claire then? I said, good God, Richard, no. Good God, no. He said, looks like you are. I said, no, don't be silly, Richard. Nobody will ever. No, 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 nobody. He said, I will. I said, what? He said, I will. I said, I bet you won't. He said, what do you bet me? I said, I bet you a pint. Now, this is disgraceful. I love you. Perhaps you do. Perhaps it means something to have your general lie back in your arms, even though he's heartily sick of the whole campaign, tired and hungry and dry. I got in on a Monday night uh, to play another Hamlet. You know, I've been playing it by this time for, I suppose, six months or so. And it's a very exhausting part. 
even at that age. And I think I'd been on a slight uh, binge over the weekend. I wasn't uh, my usual self. And I was in my dressing room and the manager of the old Vic came in and said, do be good tonight because the old man's in front. Now the old man, as you know, means only one person in England. And there he was sitting in the front row. And the front row of the old Vic is literally within arm's length. And uh, I heard this dull, thunderous kind of rumbling in the stalls and I wondered what it might be. And it was Churchill, who spoke every line with me. <laughs> now, this was fairly disconcerting, so I tried to shake him off. And I went fast, I went slow, I went backwards, I went edgeways, but the old man caught up with me all the time. And the, one of the things that happened in those days was whether you could keep Churchill after the first act. So I looked through the spy hole at the end of the first act, and by gosh, she was leaving. And I thought, that's it, we've lost him. So I went back to my dressing room, and suddenly the door opened, and standing there was Churchill, and he bowed to me very courteously, because he's a great Elizabethan courtier. He said, my Lord Hamlet, may I use your bathroom? You sometimes have a look of a dedicated man, not to that particular cause. Me dedicated? Well, what do you believe in? <laughs> well, don't laugh. Tell me. Well, I believe that a number 11 bus will get me to Hammersmith. I do not believe it will be driven by uh, Father Christmas. That's not a cause. Or would you like me to believe in Peter Pan? Or God? Or oh, no, of course not. I don't believe in God either. No? What do you believe in? Me? History. Partly. Partly freedom, partly. <laughs> well, nah. It's the innocents who get slaughtered. Compassion isn't enough. Nobody wants that. Well, it, it's got to be organized, disciplined to be of any use. You're too proud for that, aren't you? Nah. Don't let's argue, Alec. This evening was meant to please you. Oh, it did. It did. Well, I have to go away early tomorrow morning. I could tell. I'll be back. Nunley Johnson, who was a very, very close friend, was producing a film called My Cousin Rachel for 20th Century Fox. And there was the role of a young man in it, and he wanted somebody new. And so both Bogey and I told him about Richard. And so they sent for him to make a test. At that time, we just had a son, who Richard used to call Bogey Bach. You know, it's all very Welsh. And he had a great time with him. And of course, uh, Steve, our son, who was did not pronounce all of his words brilliantly, called Richard wretched. Little did he know <laughs> how wretched he really was going to become. <laughs> going to a place like Hollywood for a kid like Richard must have been an incredible shock to his system. He wasn't going to show them that he was impressed at all, you know. I mean, he was going to be in charge. But he always, from the beginning, would fall into the Dylan Thomas syndrome, where he would imitate and, you know, I think that he used it with women, promising something just with his attitude, you know, that God knows. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what women fell and didn't fall. I was not one of them. To my distant, but very dear cousin. To mine, with a heart full of love and gratitude. I remember when he told me that he was going to move to Switzerland. I said, why? Taxes. Something clicked in my head, and I thought, why is he thinking about that already? I mean, Richard was interested in a lot of superficial stuff that didn't have to do with human beings. It had to do with things and possessions and position. 
shops. I mean, it's all convenient and nice, and no one's knocking having money or what money can bring, but to sell yourself for that, which is finally what I think he did. My father went to see Richard's films, and um, he only looked at Richard. He wasn't a film goer at all, but he was looking at him. And when we went to see um, uh, my cousin Rachel, uh, I said, did you enjoy it? Well, I didn't like all that kissing, he said. Uh, well, it's only acting. Oh, it looked real to me, and I don't think Sybil would like that, he said. <laughs> went to Hollywood uh, with Sybil the first time, they went like a couple of Welsh pirates on a raid. They didn't think they were going to go again. Hollywood was magic. It was an amazing place. They thought, all this money, even with the taxes, we'll go and get hold of it, bring it back, give it back to our Welsh pals and families, and skin them alive if we can. It's only that it's my 25th But birthday. the myth then grew that he'd sold out, that he'd given into Hollywood. It was just a myth, but it became very, very strong myth. And it repeated itself in apocryphal stories, like Olivier is supposed to have sent him a telegram saying, you now have to decide whether you're going to be a household name or a great actor. But of course, Burton, like Olivier, became both. Poor monk in simplicity of spirit. Is it a path to bring me nearer to you? Or is it too easy a way? Perhaps even a luxury. The path to holiness in this monastery is too effortless. I think it would be too easy to buy you like this. I shall take up the mitre again, and the golden cope, and the great silver cross. And I shall go back and fight with the weapons it has pleased you to give me. For the rest, thy will be done. My career with 20th Century Fox was somewhat checkered. I did some films that I enjoyed and wanted to do, and a lot of films that I didn't want to do. And there was no way of my persuading anybody that I wasn't right for them or that the scripts weren't good. Not the most interesting period of my life from the artistic point of view. But uh, I have no self-criticism at all. I firmly believe that if people will pay money to see me in the theatre or in the films, that's their responsibility and not mine. It's virtually every man for himself. I don't think anybody wants to help you particularly. When I go out there, I'm battling the world. I have to beat the world. I have to be the best. I do it because I rather like being famous. I rather like being given the best seat in the plane, best seat in the restaurant. After all, the fundamental basis of uh, being an actor is uh, to make money. He thought it was a pleasant interlude between real acting, which in those days to him was the old Vic. And I mean, he did in fact walk out of his contract and went back to the old Vic. And uh, the head of the studio with 20th Century Fox it's supposed when he heard that Richard was not going to do the film he'd been, he had been contracted to do and was returning to the old Vic, this man said, who is old Vic and what's he paying him? I'll pay him double. Production chief Daryl Zanuck sets a Hollywood precedent as he awards three of the principal players in the robe gold medals for their performances in the picture. One discovered that he had many brothers and that they were all in the pits. And it became quite uh, obvious to me that he was somewhat obsessed anyway to get them all out of the pits, which in fact he did. I mean, that, that was the course that he set himself. He, he wanted to make money to get them all out of that situation, and he did it. When Richard told him the figure he earned for a certain film, my father couldn't believe it. He said, what for? And Richard admitted to this day, you couldn't tell him. 
It was an extraordinary time. But when we came out of the stage door, the whole of Waterloo Road was blocked with this giant crowd of two teams of bobby soxers, one with Richard's name knitted into their scarves and one with my name. And of course the, the media took that up and christened us and we had these nicknames, the Welsh Wizard and the Wills and Wonder. I was playing Iago and Richard Othello and my boss phoned me one night and said, well, what about alternating the roles? I said, no, 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 I can't do that. I said, Iago is an enormous part to learn and it's very difficult. And he said, well, it's a challenge. He said, you, you know, Richard's agreed to do it. The next morning, I went into it. I said, thanks a lot. I mean, that was, a, that was terrific, you know. Fancy being fool enough to agree to do that. He said, Michael told me you'd agreed to do it. So we were tricked into it. <laughs> now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this sun of York. I don't know if I want to be a magnificent Olivia type actor, you know, he's uh, a stupendous actor. But the demands on a stage actor, especially in repertory where you do five or six plays at the same time, are enormous and also enormously difficult to make any money at it. I mean, any real money. So I drank very heavily, and for about 10 years, I went through a sort of, uh, I can only describe it as some sort of male menopause, and I didn't really care what I did. Nothing else brought him more fame or affection than his portrayal of King Arthur in Camelot. There have been few theatrical moments more moving, more cherished by more people than the words that became so much a part of Richard Burton. Each evening, from December to December, before you drift to sleep upon your cot, think back on all the tales that you remember of Camelot. Ask every person if he's heard the story and say it loud and clear if he has not, that once there was a fleeting wisp of glory called Camelot. Proposition. If I could choose from every woman who breathes on this earth the face I would most love, the smile, the touch, the voice, the heart, the laugh, the soul itself, every detail and feature to the smallest strand of hair. I'm a king, not a man, and a civilized king. Could it possibly be civilized to destroy what I love? Could it possibly be civilized to love myself above all? Did they ask for this calamity? Can fashion be selected? Is there any doubt of their devotion to me or to our table? By God, Excalibur, we shall be a king! This, this is the time, King Arthur, and we reach for the stars. And compassion is not weakness. We are civilized, resolved. We shall live through this together, Excalibur. They, you and I. And God have mercy on us all. They're waiting for us at the table. Let's not delay the celebrations. Three days now I've waited for an audience with you alone. What is the purpose of the audience? Now get out, all of you. I wish to see Her Majesty privately. You stand before the throne of Egypt. I know where I am. You will state your purpose. Matters I have no intention of discussing publicly. I do not grant private audiences to unidentified persons. I am Marcus Antonius. I know who you are. What are you at the moment? In Boy Rome. Proconsul of all the Roman Empire to the east of Italy. An impressive title. Worthy, perhaps, of a private audience. Without a treaty of alliance with Egypt, you could not hold the territories under your command. True? Possibly. Then, Lord Antony, you come before me as a suppliant. If you choose to regard me as such. I do. You will therefore assume the position of a suppliant before this throne. You will kneel. I will what? On 
your knees. You dare ask the proconsul of the Roman Empire? I asked it of Julius Caesar. I demand it of you. We paid $50,000 to get Richard out of Camelot. I think he got a nominal fee for Cleopatra, maybe 75. When Elizabeth made a million dollars a film, she was maybe one of two people in the world that did that. They said, why did Burton go after the leading lady? We are saying, why did the cat go after the mouse? Name the leading lady that he did not go after. No, Burton said, well, he got very drunk. I'll be this indiscreet. He he did give voice to that. I'll use her, the phrase, I'll use her. She's going to make me millions. Oh, yes, he did. And you come all this way for just this one night, huh? all this way to make a fool of me. Perhaps you would feel less of a fool if you stayed the night with me, is that it? I've told you before, with you, words do not come easily to me. There is too much unsaid within me that I cannot say. And I cannot know. I know much one of the things that astonished him about Elizabeth was that when they did their first scenes together, he was absolutely appalled because he said she is doing nothing. And he went to the director and said that she's doing nothing. I cannot act with this. It's a plank. And also I can't hear what she's saying. I can't hear my cues. This is a farce. And Mankiewicz said, I tell you what, come and see the rushes tomorrow. See that scene you've just done. Though Richard reluctantly went, and he couldn't believe it. His magic personality came off the screen. Everything that I shall ever want to hold or look upon or have or be is here now with you. Just don't be sorry for myself. Queens are sometimes no better at that than kings or even princes. It doesn't seem fair. What I feel, I should have felt long ago, when I was very young, when I could say to myself that this was how love was. Cleopatra cost about $40 million in those days. So, so I imagine nowadays love. it would cost $150 million. And Elizabeth had to make an entrance into Rome. They built the forum a half again as big as the original forum. I shall never know why. And there were black panthers and there were elephants and 80 Nubian slaves who weren't black enough, so they were painted blacker than they were. There were 40 dwarfs painted as zebras sitting on 40 donkeys also painted as zebras, so they had to start two o'clock in the morning making up these people. And they'd been rehearsing, the dancers had been rehearsing for months. And so Joe Mankiewicz, the director, said, OK, roll them. Well, we had something like, I think, five cameras going. And the whole thing starts, and the music starts, and the tambourines go, and boom, and all come the dancers, and, they're doing, and then the panthers, and the elephants, and Elizabeth on top of the thing, and these thousands of extras. And suddenly, Joe Mankiewicz said, cut, cut, God damn it. He said, get that guy out of here. There was a chap selling ice cream in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, in a part of Cleopatra, Elizabeth was giving Rich quite a slap across the face. And she was mad and she said, oh, give her one back, Rich. Don't you take that from her. And the people uh, were saying, shh, shh, uh, uh, because they were, didn't like it, that she was making her, it's all right, Lev, I know him very well. He's from Ponte de Venice. I used to nurse him, say, I know his mother well. Shh, they were going like that. Give her one back, Rich. Well, as the film was going on, then Rich had a part that he slapped her. Good boy, Rich. That's the way to do it. I would say to Elizabeth, what? what is going on here? And she said, nothing, we're just good friends. And I was getting visits from Richard at three or four in the morning. Was he going to be the cuckolded lover or the complete lover? Elizabeth belonged to that generation of American film actresses who were raised as if they were nunneries in the major studios. In other words, they learned about dressing from the wardrobe lady. And they learned their morals the same way. And most of it was drummed into her that you do not have illicit love affairs. 
If you love a man and he loves you, no matter what the encumbrance, you stand hand to hand and you face the world. We love each other, which she did once or twice and probably had her face kicked in. A back street affair? Oh, absolutely out, and she believed that. Without you, Anthony, this is not a world I want to live in, much less conquer. Because for me, there would be no love anywhere. Do you want me to die with you? I will. Would you want me to live with you? Whatever you choose. He shook himself very dreadfully in doing what he did. And in some way never quite recovered from that. And having dealt so destructive a blow to a fact, the marriage, and to another person, Sybil, I think from then on had an element of, I don't care what is destroyed, including myself. I want my luggage as a member of the division of the is a rotten luggage. Get away. You impertinent little phony. Messing in people's lives and you don't know what any of it's about. For your own sake, don't ever do that again. I have no public school scruples about hitting girls. If you slap my face, by God, I lay you out. You would, you're the type. You bet I'm the type. I'm the type that detests physical violence. You may come out of it quick, eh? Get... Jimmy, eh? One of these days, I may write a book about us all. It's all here. It'll be written in flames a mile high. And it won't be recollected in tranquility either. Picking daffodils with Auntie Wordsworth. It'll be written in fire and blood. My blood. <laughs> broke up, which was when I was four or five, my mother never spoke to my father again. In fact, she spoke to him once on the telephone, and that was it. Because that's my mother. She simply, her, her life, I mean, that part of her life was over. And she felt that there was no point in being friends or trying to maintain a sort of um, civil friendliness. Well, uh, I'm not Yeah, she's got a better box. Is, <laughs> is that right? Well, that's wonderful, Liz. I think everybody's glad to hear that. <laughs> it'll not last. As bad as I am. It'll last then, huh? You know it. How do you feel, Dick? What about? Liz says she's never been happier in her life than with you. Uh, yeah, I feel the same way. It'll last a while. Then. A while? Yeah. Just watch it. it. Hearing thy mildness praised in every ah! touch. Thy uh, virtue spoken of and thy beauty sounded, <laughs> yet not so deeply as thou dost deserve. Myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. Moved? In good time. They him that moved you hit a remove you hence. I knew you were the first, you were immovable. <laughs> Why? <laughs> What's immovable? A stool. Right there. <laughs> Then sit on me. Oh! Asses are made to bear, and so are you. <laughs> Women are made to bear, and so are you. Not such a load as yours. The uh, conduct of Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton is a public outrage and highly detrimental to the uh, public morals of the youth of our nation. Uh, our subcommittee is going to pursue this matter until we have a final determination uh, by both Justice and the Department of uh, State. Uh, now, I can see no difference, no significant difference between the infamous Christine uh, Keeler and uh, Randy Davies cases and the uh, case of Richard Burton. Uh, I had known him off and on for about nine years, and my attitude was sort of 
resentful and like, I'm not going to be another notch in his gun bill. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of that was going on. Mm. And then the first day on the set, he was hung over and very vulnerable and his hands were shaking. He asked me to hold a coffee cup up to his lips and I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> he was so sweet. <laughs> Here was the most famous actress of that time, beautiful beyond words, you know, very beguiling. And also very different from anything Dada had really come across. Her manner was a very, um, it was an American, real, almost coarse in some ways. And I think it probably just knocked his socks off. Oh. Was told me you were rough oh. and coy and sullen. Oh. And now I find report a very liar, without a pleasant, gamesome, oh. passing courteous. At the outset, I don't think he had any idea what exactly was going to happen with Elizabeth. I don't think he thought it through at all. And maybe that was part of the whole experience. And I'm not going to say, oh, you know, he didn't know what he got into and it's not his fault. I mean, it does take two to tango and he definitely made some decisions along the way. Oh, Mary, so I mean to warn me in thy bed. Oh! It was bigger than anything that he had ever imagined. He had never th imagined himself falling in love or falling in crazed sort of obsession with someone like this. And suddenly, and not only that, but the ramifications of what it did to him in terms of publicity and, I mean, they were hounded. Mr. Mr. Burton, your ex-wife has remarried a rock and roll singer. How did that news strike you when you heard it? No, I was delighted. I was delighted. I'm sure that she did uh, very well. Has she for forfeited a million dollars in alimony, as we've heard? Uh, she's very rich in her own right, you know. I don't think uh, we have to worry about her financial standing. Uh, I think she'll manage. Uh, occasionally, I borrow from her. Miss Taylor, does a film star ever become accustomed to being asked personal questions aboard ships at every place she goes? Does what? Does a film star ever become accustomed to being asked very personal questions? No. Would you? Do you resent them? Sometimes, if they're too personal. I find it a, uh, an affront on my privacy. What about this news conference? How would you characterize this one? Well, I think you've had enough. Our subcommittee held executive hearings this morning to examine into the administration of the immigration and nationality laws. Now, both the State Department and Justice Department representatives stated that they would re-examine uh, their position with reference to the glowing, grow, a growing clamor to keep out persons of the same caliber. He craves no other tribute at thy hands but love. Fair looks and true obedience. Too little payment for so great a debt. Such duty the subject owes the prince. Even such a woman oweth to her husband. My hand is ready. May it do him ease. Why, there's a witch. Come on and kiss me, Kate. Please. Diamonds are the girl's best friend. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Just Taylor, put your hold to the camera. Yeah, really up close to the camera. Hold up, it up, up to the camera. the camera. That's it. I hope my fingernails are clean. <laughs> Small forward from your face towards me, if you will, with your hand. Fractionally over there. Thank you. I mean, people got so frightened about it because it's so remarkable. Uh, Gem, have you seen it? Just now. It's, it's a work of art. It really is an extraordinary piece. Dad always needed to have someone a woman, usually. He, it was hard for him to be alone. And I think it would be one thing to have a woman who would basically take care of him, look after him in a very kind of pleasant, calm relationship with him. But Elizabeth was used to the same thing as well. The only thing that worries me about it is that the lady for whom it was uh, bought uh, was called Vera Krupp. And um, 
and she left her husband after six months of marriage with the ring. And if Elizabeth leaves me in six months, I'm joining the ring. That's all I can tell you. She was used to having a guy there who would take care of her and who would be very, and I think that they both wanted these things from each other, but they couldn't really provide them for each other. It's as brutal as that. I shrank my own life. No one can do it for you. I settled for being pallid and provincial out of my own eternal timidity. The old, the old story of bluster and do bugger all. I didn't even dare to have children. Didn't dare to bring children into a house and marriage as cold as mine. I tell everyone, I'm the pagan, some pagan. Such wild returns I make to the womb of civilization. Three weeks a year in the Mediterranean, every bed booked in advance, every meal paid for with vouchers, cautious jaunts in hired cars, suitcase crammed with pectate. What a fantastic surrender to the primitive. I think that as a result of my marriage to Elizabeth, I became a far more important actor than I was before as a result of that stupid and stupendous publicity. But it did mean that we could choose absolutely what we did. Now, there were some things that we chose badly, but for the most part, we chose well. She is, of course, the best film actress in the world, I think. She taught me the economy, the spareness of voice, of movement, of gesture. It seems to me when your face, as she explains to me, is going to be 38 feet high and 30 feet wide, then you have to be very careful how Massively, you register any emotion of laughter, of idiocy, of delight, of tragedy, whatever it is. The basic Richard would have been as happy telling funny stories or reciting poetry in a pub. But when he got surrounded by the glamour of Hollywood and by Elizabeth Taylor's uh, fame and uh, showy uh, personality, it sort of infected him and he learned to do it as well as she did, if not better. <laughs> And I remember so well when we were doing the Hamlet in America, and he came in and he threw his coat to him in a sort of terrifically grand way, just threw it off his shoulders, it was on his shoulders. And then we sat down and had lunch, and then I asked for the bill, and Richard said, oh, no, no, and we got up and walked towards the door. And he said, well, they'll pay, and there was all the other, the entourage sitting at neighboring tables who were left to pay the bill and <laughs> clean up after us. Broadway opening is the most terrifying in the world, and I played in, Denmark, in Paris, in London, everywhere, you know, everywhere you can think of in Western Europe. But unquestionably, the Broadway opening is the one that's the most frenetic, the most disturbing, the most exciting, and if you hit the jackpot, the most rewarding. He suddenly wrote and said, would I direct him in Hamlet? So I said, I would love to, but how do you want to do it? Because I'd seen him in it at the Vic. And I made one of my celebrated bricks when we came right afterwards, and he'd arranged to have supper with me and the dressing room was full of people. And I went to the door and said, well, Richard, see you when you're better. I mean, when you're ready. <laughs> Elizabeth, she's helped me tremendously with Hamlet by, for instance, reading the stage directions, which I never have in my life. And she said, do you realize that at this point he prays? And I say, oh, don't be silly. She says, yeah, it says here he prays. So I prayed, it worked too. <laughs> what they said at the time about Burton's achievement with Shakespeare was quite straightforward, but he made it sexy. He brought that passionate realism back to the lines to have impact now for people watching it now, which is always the great difficulty. He did it with enormous ferocity and effect. And then this Hamlet, which he took to New York, at great risk, he hadn't been on the stage for years, he was always taking these great risks, pulling everything out of himself. He ran in New York for longer than any Shakespeare had ever run before. 136 performances, he was doing eight performances a week. He got the most astounding reviews, one of the longest parts in Shakespeare, and he was carrying it night after night after night. But typical of Burton, once he'd learnt it and achieved it, he began to get bored. He would do some of the speeches in German. He would do some of the speeches uh, as if he were Gilgood. He would pretend to be Olivia, see if anybody had noticed. He'd drink a bottle of vodka and ask at the end, was I any different? No, you're a little bit better. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing any. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is there to. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished to die. To sleep. To sleep.
be a chance to dream. Aye, there's the rub. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's a respect that makes calamity of so long life. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time? The oppressor's wrong. The proud man's contumely, the pangs of disprized love, the laws delay, the insolence of others, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes, when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin. See, Burton never left the stage. Again and again, he came back to it. For instance, he came back to do Equus on Broadway. He was supposed to be wrecked. He was supposed to be dissipated. He was supposed to be too drunk to be bankable. He came back, in a sense, to audition for the film. The undiscovered country from whose boon no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. Massive speeches there. Mind you, he had a memory like a clamp. He could remember whole plays of Shakespeare. He could, he could recite some sonnets backwards. He beat Bobby Kennedy in a bet once about reciting Shakespeare's sonnets by reciting sonnet number 15 backwards when they were both uh, drunk and he won quite a considerable sum of money. Uh, but he went back to do Equus, uh, terrified, shaking, shaking before he went on the stage. Mind you, that might have something to do with the fact that we've now discovered that there was an epilepsy running through his life, a mild, increasing epilepsy. He also had a terrible battered back, uh, which afflicted him throughout his life increasingly. He could hardly raise his arms at certain times. I mean, he was a wounded man. Oh, it's the first time I've been out. He sent his white rolls to my house. And when I got there, there were these 14 Portuguese sailors looking after them, and terrible tourists passing by on boats, one of them shouting out, on our left, Captain Cook's grave graveyard. On our right, Mr. and Mrs. Richard Burton's yacht. And, and Richard was shouting rude words. And Elizabeth saying, no, 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 you must blow them a kiss. You must blow them a kiss. You must show you how sweet they are. And also, as I arrived, they were having a terrible row. He was on the deck with about 18 <laughs> income tax people and people to do with his money. And she was locked in the cabin after he had a row with somebody else. And then, by, when lunchtime arrived, who should arrive but Ringo Starr and his wife Maureen? And I don't think they'd ever heard of me, and I'd only just heard of them, so that didn't make the conversation much easier. George? Yes, love? Why don't you want to kiss me? Well, dear, if I kissed you, I'd get all excited. I'd get beside myself, and then I'd have to take you by force, right here on the living room rug. And <laughs> our little guests would walk in, and, well, what would your father say about that? Oh, you pig. <laughs> oink, oink. Fix me another drink, lover. My God, you can swill it down, can't you? Well, I'm thirsty. Oh, Jesus. Look, sweetheart, I can drink you under any goddamn table you want, so don't worry about me. I gave you the prize years ago, Martha. There isn't an abomination award going that you haven't won. You know, it was one thing when they were both sober. But then, of course, Elizabeth had a, had a drinking problem as well. And pills. I mean, Dad had never did the pills. Um, to that extent. Although I know with painkillers, I think that he, he really did get quite um, used to having those all the time. When, when his back was so awful for all those years. And one of the things that used to make me very angry, actually, was this sort of little coterie of people would not really try to help him. You know, that, that, that as I got older and, and really got really wised up, I remember having a big argument with one of them um, and saying, and they said, you know, you're so, you're so tough on your father. And I said, you guys, you know, I'm the only one who seems to be helping him. The chaos, the many hangers-on, you see, in those days. Um, this terrific entourage, of which I was part, sometimes a part, I may say, uh, of hairdressers and chauffeurs and photographers and uh, batmen and all sorts of things, makeup people, you know. And it was a circus that hit town, really. I mean, I remember travelling once with Richard and Elizabeth, a short distance from, from London to Geneva, and she had 37 pieces of luggage and eight animals. Oh, Hi, baby. Day. I did it all for you. I thought you'd like it, sweetheart. It's to your taste, blood carnage and all. I thought you'd sort of get excited, sort of uh, heave and pant and come running at me, your melons bobbling. You have really screwed up, George. Oh, come on. I mean, you really have. 
You can sit around with the gin running out of your mouth. You can humiliate me. You can tear me to pieces all night. That's perfectly okay. That's all right. You can stand it. I cannot stand it. You can stand it. You married me for it. I mean, I find anyone that lives like that is, first of all, not living. It's all a big joke. It's all right to have a joke once, but I mean, to have it continue for that long, I, I found totally obscene. I mean, people starving all over the world, and just, I mean, who the hell lives like that and buys all that? I mean, I, I just think it's revolting. In the meantime, there are people that are breathing and uh, in need of other things. But you see, I don't think Richard was capable of giving other things. I mean, that, I feel, finally was the problem. I don't think he understood what friendship was about, or love, or care really was about. When he left Sybil, he gave her everything. Every single penny. Everything. Uh, and he did that with all the wives. He, came, he was princely about that. He came, it went. And his generosity, at one stage, I calculated that he was supporting 42 people. This wasn't the odd thing. This was your annual checks plus top-up checks at Christmas. An extra came onto a film with him once, went up, and he heard uh, that she couldn't pay off a mortgage debt of over £26,000, which was crippling her children and all the rest of it. Quietly, he paid it off. That happened time and again. He had this great eruptive talent. I mean, when he was a kid, he erupted in boils. He also erupted in gifts. And this devil was thrashing him around. What was he to do with himself? What was it for? To be or not to be actually meant something vital to Richard Burton. I've tried with you, baby. I've really tried. I've come off it, Martha. I've really tried. You're a monster. You are. I'm loud and I'm vulgar and I wear the pants in the house because somebody's got to. But I am not a monster. I'm not. You're a spoiled, self-indulgent, willful, dirty-minded, liquor-ridden. Yeah. There was a second back there. Yeah, there was a second. Just a second when I could have gotten through to you, when, when maybe we could have cut through all this, this crap. As things began to slip for him, in, in him, that, that the members of the group became, in his mind, interchangeable, that, that he just needed to be with people, but that who it was mattered to him less and less. I, I think that there are great dangers in, in acting and that, that perhaps he, to some extent, fell into one of them, which was that, that he began to confuse seeming and being. And that, that he could all, I mean, he prided himself enormously and it was that sort of Welsh, Welsh pride in being able to do a whole performance of a play completely sloshed and, and and once he took the leap into movie magazine immortality with elizabeth then i think that that he had left behind any core of of being that he was entirely surrounded by seeming and i think that left him very lonely it's not what i wanted well, at least you were onto yourself. I didn't know. I'm I didn't onto know. myself. No, no, no. You're sick. I'll show you who's sick. I'll show you who's sick. I'll show you. All right, my dear. I'll show you. 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 Stop it. Stop it. Oh, boy. You really are having a field day, aren't you? I'm going to finish you before I'm through with you.
stand up there in the pulpit and you say, I will teach you infinities. I will say to you that the greatest poem in the English language is the present tense of the verb to be. Now, one asks, what is the present tense of the verb to be? Now, I'll speak for you, right? It's like this. The present indicative of the verb to be. I am, thou art, she is, he is. I hate my looks, I hate my hair, I hate my body, I hate everything. I don't like myself at all. I'm afraid I'm an actor. I don't want to be an actor, uh, but uh, however I am. And uh, uh, I don't know, you know, you ask anybody uh, what, why they do something, why they do this, why they do that, whatever it is, and they don't know. Uh, no more than I know. It's an odd profession for a man because you are so vulnerable at the beginning and once you become a big star then maybe you know that it's different than you're much less vulnerable and you're much more in a position of power. But I think the thing with dad too is that you know he always gave across this kind of bravado and this sort of bravura you know attitude towards life but I think there was a lot of insecurity an enormous amount of insecurity about himself Certainly with the whole thing about Oxford, you know, as an intellectual or quasi-intellectual. Also, as a man. I've heard what your courtiers say, and I've seen what you are. You're spoiled and vengeful and bloody. Your poetry is sour and your music is worse. You make love as you eat, with a good deal of noise and no subtlety. This is not safe. Yes, I've been told it's not safe for any of us to say no to our king. That put on, kindly, hail fellow well met of yours. There is no better way to make an end than to raise anger in me. I thank you for that. You made a fool of me, and I'm well out of it. It's amazing that what everyone likes is the voice. Yeah, they all talk about the voice. I don't know what the hell it is. Yeah, I was just saying about the voice where I get it from, I don't know. There's uh, unquestionably a kind of strange if you see uh, you walk on the stage or you walk on the screen or whatever it is, you feel a strange kind of power. I think I'm a sort of animal because if you act perfectly, goodly, wellly, uh, it is a kind of honesty. I'm mad for you. I dream of you at night. I long for you by day. And you dare to tell me that I have the power? I'm no good with any other woman. I think of nothing but you. Of you and me playing dog and bitch. Of you and me playing horse and mare. Of you and me in every way. I want to fill you up night after night. I want to fill you up with sons. Bastards. I was into my third bottle a day, so a friend of mine told me. Uh, being into my third bottle, I wasn't aware of the fact that I was into it. But um, he told me so, and I was, I was somewhat surprised. And he, he, this same friend, he's actually here, uh, said, would you have a blood test? And they took a blood test, and they, it was, of course, I was X. I was anonymous in the blood test. And they said, this person, if he keeps on as he's going, because they'd written an account of what my behavior was, if he goes on as he is, we'll have approximately two weeks to live. I think uh, that the uh, essential uh, uh, thing that I must do is um, quietly uh, room myself into the grave, you know, uh, uh, sleep, sleep, sleep. Sleep is so fundamental. Ever tell you that poem about sleep? 
How can you turn the world upside down? Uh, what rules are you playing? There's only one rule. Expediency. What the hell do you think spies are? Moral philosophers measuring everything they do against the word of God or Karl Marx? They're not. They're just a bunch of seedy, squalid bastards like me. Little men, drunkards, queers, henpecked husbands, civil servants, playing cowboys and Indians to brighten their rotten little lives. Do you think they sit like monks in the cell, balancing right against wrong, so that the great moronic masses you admire so much can sleep soundly in their flea-bitten beds again for the safety of ordinary, crummy people like you and me? You killed Fiedler! How big does a course have to be before you kill your friends? Like many great actors, I think he hated acting. I think he was very ashamed of being an actor. You know, Richard seemed to be a prisoner of a fantasy of having sold his soul to the devil. And he was always very aware of what the, the other guys were doing that he wasn't doing. The plays Olivier was doing, the plays Schofield was doing, what he felt he should be doing, and what he feared he was doing instead. You must at some time have faced the question of whether you should have continued as a, an imposing, and even in the view of many people, great stage actor, or moved into the world of films, which is more commercially rewarding, but perhaps not so rewarding artistically. Do you ever regret having moved into the commercial cinema? Oh, excuse you me, are. Richard, that makes me so angry, because he has not left the stage. You That's must absolute you bloody rubbish. Listen well, last year, he just got through doing a thing here for Oxford on the stage. The year before that, what was he doing I I on Broadway? That was the stage. But How can you say he's left the because stage? Because that is not a continuous stage career in the sense that, um, for example, Paul Schofield or Lawrence Olivier. He's not continuous either on the stage. He Schofield does film appearances for money. This is and so does Paul Schofield. But Schofield has made one film in 10 or 14 years. I'm not young. I'm not true. I'm... Bitter, I'm envious, I'm dangerous, I'm malicious. I, I think I'm reasonably uh, intelligent, uh, clever, good, kind, sweet, nasty. Um, gifted? Oh, no. I'm not a gifted. No. Dad was very lonely. It was almost like he got to the point where he was incapable of figuring out how to, how to solve that. Dad became increasingly isolated. He completely lost touch with a lot of people because of his insecurities. But why wasn't he secure enough? Well, first he was repeatedly taken out of his environment, his home, if you like and Pygmalion-like made into this great young British actor. He was repeatedly thrust into situations which maybe he wasn't able to deal with. I think Susan Hunt provided a very important gift to him, and then she managed to help him leave Elizabeth. I don't think she anticipated what it would be like, you know, because by that time, it was hard for Dada to converse. He would tell stories. He would be sort of like, stories, 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 stories. But in terms of just chatting, but that came again from nervousness and insecurity. It's like, oh God, you know, I really have to have a conversation with this person. I wonder, okay, well, I'll just tell these three stories. They're really funny. So, I forget what I mean. I went home, I went to the house, and asked where he was, and they said, where do you think? And actually, I knew where he was, and he was in the pub, and I went over, and I gave him a fiver. My brother said, don't give him so much money, you know, because he doesn't drink it. Well, he, uh, he sure was hell drank it. The police came to the door, and there was a thunderous knocking on the door, and I woke up, and I went down. The police said, your father is seriously ill. He'd fallen off the Bontevar and Ponte de Ven. When we went with a nephew to this hospital, and uh, went to the emergency waiting room, and there was a... Uh, there were two English, we called them English, because they couldn't speak Welsh. Actually, they were Welsh, I think. And there was a lady doctor and a man doctor. And they came out and they said, does anybody here speak Welsh? And my nephew and my brother and myself said, we, we all speak Welsh. And they said, well, we've got a man in here who cannot speak English. Would you come? We think he's in a state of shock. Would you come in and translate? So we said, right, we went in, it was my father. He was lying there and he had a bruise on his stomach. 
the size of a rugby football. He's lying, he's singing, perfectly happy. And I said, well, that's actually, that's my father, and his uncle, and his grandfather. And they said, well, would you ask him if he knows who you are? So I said, Dinapodvi, you know me? And then in perfect English, he said, only too bloody well. Now, let me tell you what I know about him. And he went on and on and on. And he was out of the It's a very modest house, and he liked that. He could live very simply here. He would get up very early in the morning and go and make his tea and, and just be told to himself and know that there weren't um, countless members of an entourage about to interrupt him. He would very often cook his own breakfast. Then perhaps he'd go up to the library reading a book. We might go out to lunch to one of the local restaurants, or we would go on a boat trip, one of the ferry boats. We'd go to the supermarket together. That actually did surprise people, tourists, because they wouldn't expect to see Richard Burton in the supermarket with a trolley, but he liked that. He was without malice, and frequently surprised me that he would always find something good to say about people, polite and straight. Quite a Puritan, really, at times. could be embarrassed um, by things. It was a surprise when, on meeting him to find how gentle he was. One expected a sort of, because of the voice, one expected this overbearing character. But he was an absolute pussycat. He sees the fusion of music and drama dimly as I see it, very dimly. Greek, vast amphitheaters, life and worship in their art, sensual performances understood by everyone, slaves, masters, all equal in intellect, equal in sensitivity, same tongue, same myths, instantly accessible through shared desires, experience, food even, the same simple Attic food, milk, wine, olives. The same women, enjoyed by master and slave alike in the same open manner. Music is feminine. It lies waiting to be fertilized, the dramatic seed thrust into it. Words taken up and carried further by the music, but poetry Poetry is the reason for music, and drama is the reason for both. And in here are all Richard's books, and he had this made uh, because it was a loft before. It was not supposed to be a library at all. It was full of pigeons, in actual fact, but and the, the floor had to be strengthened in order to contain all his books. And he had these... Uh, shelves made that come into the room like that so you can get the books out and then put them back in again and on the floor here is his book bag what he always used to call his book bag which used to travel with him all the time uh, and it has paper bags light weight books reference books he had always a complete works of shakespeare uh, the bible his copy of the bible common prayer book the Koran. I gave him this, I remember, which is slightly moth-eaten, as you would expect, which is the complete works of William Shakespeare. Actually, it was chewed by his dog, I think. And also, he always carried with him the Dictionary of Slang and Unconventional English. To look up rude words. And he put them, when he arrived at the hotel, by his bedside, so that he could refer to them when he wanted to, and it was, it was known as the book bag. It was rather like, actually, when we were travelling, rather like the American president, 
has a man who carries what they call a football with him, which contains all the codes in case there's a nuclear war. Well, Richard would carry this. On the walls are his uh, nominations for his Oscar, which he never won, incidentally. He was nominated seven times. I think it's as many times as anybody's been nominated and never actually won. And he never cared much about winning. He went once, I remember, because I went with him, and he sat in, like, the fifth row on the aisle, as all the nominees do, and he had in his hand a piece of paper, and he was making notes. And every now and then the cameras went on to, to Richard, and he was writing things down. Best, and they assumed that best animated costume for a Walt Disney musical, he was writing down the name. He thought, oh, he was really interested. Richard Burton is fascinated by it all. He was actually learning Spanish irregular verbs because the next day we were going back to Mexico. When I was about eight, he took me under his wing, you see, because my father was really only interested in the theater and writing and everything. But Richard could do all the things that a small boy was absolutely worshiping because there's nothing Richard couldn't do. And what he couldn't do, of course, he pretended he could. I mean, he used to pretend to be a tremendous tennis player with his ace cannonball serve, which nobody could get back. Well, it was partly true, but after the cannonball serve, the game fell apart completely. Because it was so point, much like Wales, is that? Yes. Oh, yes, definitely. Well, my impression of Cellini when I first came here, that it was the next place to Wales. It was delightful. I thought it was He's so similar. He wasn't a social animal. I mean, he hated going to parties and things like that. I think he probably went to three cocktail parties in his life. So his idea of a good time would be to retire to the local with extras or the small part actors in the plays and sit around till closing time telling stories. He never really paid much attention to luxuries of any sort at all, as long as he had a shower that worked and a light that he could read a book by and a comfortable chair to sit in to read the book. That's all he cared about. And we used to, when we were on location sometimes, and in <coughs> strange hotels and strange rented houses, and the showers often didn't work properly because nobody had attended to them. And we used to unscrew. I used to carry with me a special wrench to unscrew the shower head. And we used to pick the hole, clean the hole with a hairpin. The last few years, he was in tremendous pain a lot of the time. Because he had this very severe operation on his neck, which wasted away a lot of the muscles of his shoulders. And he had a very good aversion to pills, painkillers of any kind, in actual fact. He hated pills. And I mean, he, we always used to say that two aspirin had the same effect on him as two sleeping pills on other people. And that deeply depressed him. And he was immensely brave about it. You never know. But I think he suffered from guilt about a number of things, actually. I think he felt guilty that he left uh, Sybil. And uh, by inference, his children, I think probably any man who leaves his wife for another woman feels guilty about it, if there's two children involved. And what made matters worse was that Richard's second child, Jessica, Kate's younger sister, was mentally retarded. But I remember when Jessica was a little girl, very little, toddler, he seemed to be okay, but then suddenly it became obvious and the discovery that she wasn't quite normal was made. And I think it was always a cloud, I think, the fact that Jess was not normal. Remember the mink coat? Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> that was a thrill. We saw this mink coat in the window and um, I thought, oh, it was a beauty. And he said, let's go in, he said, do you really mean it? Yes, come on, trade on, he said, to uh, Sally. And that she tried it on. It fitted her lovely. And then there was a hat to go. Would you like that trade on? Lovely. Then he brought a little, what did you call it, sir? Just a headband yeah. to go with it. Have that as well. <laughs> and then after settling all this, he said, how much? And I said, well, that's the first thing I'd ask before I think about it. How much? Well, I wouldn't tell you how much. But Sally got the cards. Since there was a little boy in him always, always. Naughty little boy sometimes. <laughs> I think he. I think one of the things that he po possibly regretted actually if it, is that he never had a son. He he loved children, but he particularly liked boys. You know, he liked to be an uncle, 
And that's why, in some ways, I did become his son. I mean, became the son he never had and couldn't have, eventually. Winston. You are thinking that my face is old and tired. That while I talk of power, I am unable to prevent the decay of my own body. The past is forbidden. Why? Because when we can cut man from his own past, then we can cut him from his family, his children, other men. Reality is in the human mind, not in the individual mind, which makes mistakes and soon perishes, but in the mind of the party, which is collective and immortal. Only the disciplined mind can see reality, Winston. It needs an act of self-destruction, an effort of the will. And see where God stretcheth out his arms and bends his ireful brows. Mountains and hills, come, come and fall on me and hide me from the heavy wrath of God. No. No. Then I will headlong run into the earth. Earth! Gate! It will not harbor me. You stars that reigned my nativity, whose influence hath allotted death and hell, now draw Faustus like a foggy mist into the entrails of yon laboring clouds, that when they vomit forth into the air, my limbs may issue from their smoky mouths, so that my soul may but ascend to heaven. Oh God, if thou would not have mercy on my soul, if for Christ's sake, whose blood hath ransomed me, impose some end to my incessant pain. Let Faustus live in hell a thousand years, a hundred thousand, and at last be saved. Cursed be the parents that engendered me. No, Faustus, curse thyself. Curse Lucifer, that hath deprived thee of the joys of heaven. He complained of a headache. Uh, clearly it was more than that. Um, I knew that there was something desperately wrong. But um, one doesn't want to believe it, really. Um, I got him into hospital and I was told to sort of come home because there were phone calls to be made, because he was supposed to start a film. So I needed to, to let them know that uh, he wasn't too well. And I think that I did, somewhere inside, I knew how ill he was, um, because I know I go driving home, sort of, I, I, I can remember thinking to myself, well, you're a good wife, but I'm not sure you're going to be a very good widow.
died, I got a lot of letters, quite a number of letters, from young actors and older actors who barely knew him, worked with him one day or maybe half a day, whose names, some of which I remember, and some I'd forgotten as it was so long ago. And they all wrote to say how sorry they were. They didn't know who else to write to. He passed through their lives, and they took the trouble to write to say how much they appreciated what he'd done for them one day. I mean, it's, in some ways, if Richard passed through your life, he lit something in you, and I don't think it ever goes out. All right, what then? He'd feel himself acceptable. What then? Do you think feelings like his can be simply reattached, like plasters stuck on other objects we select? I mean, look at him. My desire might be to make of this boy an ardent husband, a caring citizen, a worshipper of abstract and unifying God. My achievement, however, is more likely to make a ghost. I'll heal the rash on his body. I'll erase the welts cut into his mind. And when that's done, I'll put him on a metal scooter and send him puttering off into the concrete world. I doubt, however, with much passion. Passion, you see, can be destroyed by a doctor. It cannot be created. You will, however, be without pain almost completely without pain. And now, for me, it never stops. Why me? Why me? First, account for me.